Hi, I'm Dan Olson. Welcome to my YouTube channel where I host the world's top product and design leaders every month. Um, and uh, tonight we just got finished talking with Barry O'Reilly, the author of Unlearn. He's also the author of Lean Enterprise. You've probably heard of that book. His book, Unlearn, isn't coming out for three weeks, so he gave us a sneak peek, basically. Uh, it's a talk all about how to innovate, how to break out of your old habits and patterns with a lot of advice on how to think different and take small steps to basically achieve higher levels of performance with your business and with your product. So I hope you enjoy the video. If you like it, uh, if you enjoy it, please push the like button, leave a comment. Definitely subscribe to the channel so you get notified when we have other awesome speakers like Barry. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, so 800 years BC, uh, the seed of a startup. Actually, a startup that would seed one of the greatest civilizations the human would ever know started on seven mountains in Central Europe. Now, that startup uh, went on to cover 20% or two, over 2 million square miles, 20% of the world's population. It was a civilization that lasted for over 2,000 years, one of the longest civilizations we've ever known successfully rejuvenating itself. Now, there's many hypotheses about why the Roman Empire was so successful and why it was able to grow and sustain itself for such a long period of time. Does anybody know what the answer is? Roads. Roads always comes up. Good, right? That's not it. What else? They learned technologies from other people that they conquered, but I read that in the book. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Right. So uh, one of, that's, that's a great plant. You're the best plant I've had in ages. That's awesome. So the, the, uh, the truth is, as soon as they conquered other civilizations, the, as soon as they recognized that they had practices better than their own, they let go of their existing practices and adopted those practices. So they constantly had a system to learn and unlearn. And this is what helped them not only grow their empire, but sustain their empire and, and last for over 2000 years. Now this concept of uh, learning or continuous learning, I think we've heard anyone who works in our industry now at this stage, there's a, a massive expectation that we continuously have to learn. Um, and a lot of this was really blew up, I think in the 1980s with the advent of this book by Peter Swing, the or Swing, the fifth uh, element where he talked about learning organizations. And that literally was a launch pad for every single executive to go to every single business school for the next 20 years and become a learning organization. Um, and it was popularized, it went mainstream and blew up. Everybody became a learning organization. And if you weren't a learning organization, what the hell were you doing? Um, but at the same time that everyone was getting high on learning organizations, uh, there was also another part of that that was a stipulation that not many people read. Um, Bo Heidenberg, who was one of the first people to talk about that, while learning is important, it's also important to unlearn a lot of our existing behaviors because as new information comes in, so does other information become obsolete. And really what our real skill is not only taking in new information, but recognizing when things are obsolete, outdated, and need to be unlearned. Uh, but around the 1980s, this wasn't really a time of tech, massive technology innovation. You could sort of live with your existing behaviors for a long, long period of time and not feel the impact. Even actually into 1998, where we had the same sorts of organizations that were still leading the, the world um, persisted. And it stayed the same for 10 years after that. Um, so nothing really, really changed. Everybody was these learning organizations, but then suddenly everything changed. The impact of technology, companies that started to build platforms that could rapidly gather, synthesize, and be give better insights to help companies learn and unlearn behaviors that weren't working, radically just blew away the competition. Um, and this is a problem because most people get trapped in a very linear mindset of the world. The things that made them successful in the past, they believe are gonna make them successful in the future. These large organizations with very similar business models weren't changing and adapting until suddenly you have an exponential impact when organizations start to recognize the advent of technology and how they can actually disrupt and change 
the way businesses are done. Because the truth is, it's not actually uh, organizations uh, that get disrupted. The truth is, it's individuals who get disrupted. Individuals who hold on to legacy behaviors or features about how they operate, while the world, the systems that they operate within change massively. So something to think about yourself is, could you be disrupted? Are you holding on to the same behaviors that made you successful in the past and expecting you to be successful in the future? And this is one of the reasons why I talk a lot about on learning. And people often get very nervous when I say the word unlearn because they think it's throwing out all their existing knowledge and experience, but that's not actually the case. And um, unlearning is the act of letting go. It's reframing and recognizing that your think thinking and behaviors that were effective in the past now are actually um, outdated. And it's a conscious act of letting go of outdated information to make space for new information to come in to inform your thinking and as a result to inform your behavior and allow you to adapt to the current circumstances, making better decisions and taking better action. Now, I coach lots of executives from Fortune 500 companies to scaling startups here in San Francisco. And one of the things I constantly came up against was the ability of these people to learn was not an issue. Yes, it's difficult to learn new things, but that's not the limiting factor. The limiting factor that kept holding people back was their inability to unlearn their existing mental models and behaviors and continue to apply it to the same context that they're in. So this got me thinking about, well, what are the kind of things that we need to do? And it got me thinking about this cycle of unlearning. And it was really about identifying what do people need to unlearn. And the way I would identify that is, where are you not living up to the expectations you have yourself? Where have you set an outcome and you're struggling to achieve it? Where are you stuck with a problem and all the methods you're using, you still can't get past it? That's a signal for me that it's time to unlearn, that you're using behaviors that are not going to work for you in the current context of the problem that you're trying to solve. And once you have the courage to recognize that your existing thinking and behaviors are not working, it gives you an opportunity to relearn. And this is where experimentation is key. It's about experimenting with different types of behaviors, new techniques. And for you, that's going to feel uncomfortable. You're actually probably going to fail when you try new things. You're going to have to do things that are outside your comfort zone. But anyone who'll tell you is all growth and impact is outside your comfort zone. And until you're willing to do that, it's impossible for you to get the breakthroughs that you need, the breakthroughs in your thinking, the breakthroughs in your behavior that lead to higher performance. And the powerful part about this is it's a virtuous cycle. Once you start to recognize the power of unlearning, of letting go of legacy behaviors and thinking, seeing the benefits of relearning, experimenting with new behaviors to get the breakthroughs that you want, you just keep going. It's not a one and done cycle. It's a continuous cycle because the context we're in is going to change. Technology is going to change. Customer behavior is going to change. So you got to change. Now, who's here working on a current transformation initiative or some sort of change program? Pretty much everybody in the room. All right. And what, what's, what's the speech that we hear from the leadership every time there's a big transformation happening? What, what, what do you always hear? Change is constant. Yeah, that's always a good one. Yeah. But it's like we need to transform, right? That's normally the big speech, right? So, and what do people mean when they say we need to transform? That's right. You need to transform, not me. All right. Okay. That's okay. Is that working? Yeah, you need to transform, not me, right? And um, we'd be successful if that team over there just changed the way they work. You know, it's all their problem. Yeah? Who's been on that project? Who said that this week already? Okay. Um, now, so this is one of the sort of things about shifting mindset. So a lot of people, when I was asking at the start, what did you want to hear about tonight? Mindset is to shift. And what I found from working with these executives is I've created, I got tired of hearing that we need to transform and starting to get them to think that if you want to transform, you got to transform yourself. You can't transform other people. So what I tried to do was actually unlearn the way we do transformation. I was sick of working on these innovation projects at the edge of organizations where we'd have cross-functional teams and build great products and release them. But the system wouldn't change. The organization still stayed the same. 
we just had these little outposts of innovation floating around the organization. There wasn't a systemic change in behavior and operation about how companies operated. So I decided that I needed to unlearn how transformation is, is done. Instead of trying to transform these little tiny teams on the edge of the organization, I needed to transform the people who had the most impact on the system, the nodes of the system that had the most influence. And that inspired me to start ExecCamp. Uh, so exec camp is when I get executives to leave their business for anywhere up to eight weeks with the goal of launching new businesses to disrupt their existing organizations. Uh, and I've run this program for lots of organizations. I'll share some examples of it tonight. Um, now, normally when I say to people, I get executives to leave their business for four to eight weeks, most people sort of give me uh, this sort of reaction. Uh, <laughs> Because they're like, how the hell do you do that? My organization wouldn't do that. That's radical. That's different. And I say, well, don't worry. I've got a diagram that wiggles and goes up to the right. And um, so everything's perfect. But the purpose of exec camp is not necessarily just to generate new ideas to test your hypotheses or come up with new products. It's an opportunity for people to relearn new behaviors. And by practicing new behaviors, for, deliberately practicing new behaviors for a period of time, that's when they start to get the breakthroughs in their behavior, change their habits, shift their mindset, and, and amazing innovation happens. There's lots of characteristics that are really important to cultivate if you want to unlearn. I just want to touch on those quickly. First one is curiosity. So how many times have you been experts in your industry, 20 years in the industry, and you know exactly how that should be done? Who's had that conversation with a team member recently? When they came up with an idea and you're like, this is the way it's done rather than ask them, that's interesting, why would you want to do it that way? Curiosity gives you a chance to learn something new and challenge your assumptions. The next thing is courage. So who has the courage here to recognize that the behaviors that you're using are not being effective, that you're not achieving the outcomes that you want, that your behavior is the issue, not the other person, not the product, not the customer. You need courage to recognize when things aren't working and own it. Commitment, you've got to practice new behaviors in a different way. That means it's going to be difficult. You're going to be uncomfortable. That means you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable if you want to continuously grow and have impact in the world and help yourself move ahead. Uh, but the constituent to make all this happen is you need safety. You need to create safety for people to experiment, to feel faith, uh, safe to try new behaviors. And when they don't get intended results, see it as a learning opportunity to move forward. So these things are really, really important when you're thinking about trying to create the space for unlearning to happen, both in yourself and the teams that you're responsible for leading. So I just want to give you some examples of, of uh, the companies I've been working with to sort of go through this process. And what really inspired me as to why unlearning is such a powerful technique when applied uh, in the current context that we're working in and the rate of change and innovation that we have to cope with and uncertainty, complexity, that we've got to deal with in the products and services that we're building. And um, so the first one is the leadership mindset. When I, I asked the audience tonight uh, that what did they want to hear in this talk, pretty much everyone voted for this one. Um, and I don't blame you because there's a real problem with uh, leadership mindset at the moment. There's a problem with uh, how it exists in people and there's a problem with how we're trying to solve it. Uh, currently, $365 billion a year is spent on executive development and training but less than one in four people say that it's actually effective to the business outcomes that they're trying to drive. Getting people to sit in a room for two days uh, on certified Scrum Maniac courses or whatever you choose to get your certification in has no bearing on changing your behavior. Who spent two days on a training course and left the room and suddenly changed all their behavior as a result of being told to think differently? Nobody, right? You've got to start acting differently. And this is one of the actual counterintuitive things about shifting mindset. Everywhere I go into so many organizations, I constantly hear, we've got a mindset problem. We just have to change the mindset. Who's heard that in the last month? Um, and most people think that if you're going to shift mindset, you have to think differently. If we think differently, we'll act differently. Now, the only reason we think that is because Apple had an advert that says, think different, and everyone thinks they're great at innovation. Um, and again, that's a fallacy. If you want to shift mindset, you've actually got to shift the way you behave. And by behaving differently, you get a different perspective. And when you get a different perspective, that gives you new information that runs against your existing mental models of the world. 
And that's what makes you shift your behavior. And again, this starts to become a very powerful cycle because as you trial new behaviors and you see the benefits of those behaviors, it gives you a new perspective to shift your mindset. And as your mindset starts to shift, that actually encourages you to keep changing your behavior because it keeps the benefits of experimenting with different tools and techniques. So again, one of the most counterintuitive things, if you want to change mindset, you change the way you act to change the way you think. You don't change the way you think, hoping that it's going to change the way you act. And so an example of where I've been doing this is with International Airlines Group. Uh, they're the parent company for British Airways, Iberian, Vering and Lingus. They're probably the sixth largest airline group in the world. They've got uh, 63,000 employees. So I was taking a uh, six of their executive team out of their business for eight weeks with the goal to launch six new businesses to disrupt their existing company. And as a result of that, trying to change the behaviors and lasting mindset of those executive teams. Now, the very classic thing happened on the first um, week of the, of the camp. Um, one of the executives had this an amazing idea that they were going to use to transform the airline industry it was a new booking system that they thought would be transformational. All they had to do is follow their idea. It's been in the industry for 20 years. They had lots of expertise. We just had to build this idea and we'd be successful. Anyone ever heard a story like this before? Yeah. Right. So we sat down and the executive drew out this amazing uh, idea. He had everyone on board. And when I was like, well, why don't we go and test that with a customer? They're like, sweet. Yeah, they're going to love it. So how do you think the testing went? Well, they were like, uh, hey, what do you think of my amazing idea? <laughs> what do you think the executive's response was? <laughs> Silly customer. Get me the right customer. All right. So I was like, cool. Yeah, God. Stupid me getting that customer. I better get a different customer. Oh, yeah, it's always the customer's fault. OK, so we sat down again and we got we got another customer. And he's like, hey, what do you think about my amazing idea? Customers like it still sucks. Right. And we went through this cycle sort of two or three times. Uh, and then we sat down and did a little retrospective and reflected. Uh, and I asked the executive, you know, what, what, what do you think? Um, what do you think the problem is? And, and this executive had the breakthrough. They're like, the idea sucks. Not, it's not the customer. Um, and this was their sort of unlearning moment, right? Where they recognized that their existing behavior was not working. They had the courage to recognize that. And this executive went on to be literally one of the best experimenters I've ever worked with in my life. It reignited their curiosity because they started to see a lot of their assumptions about how their business worked, the 20 years that they'd been in it, as assumptions, as hypotheses to be tested. Um, and it reignited their curiosity because when they heard customers said these ideas suck, straight away they were like, this is amazing. How can I make it better? And they started to run experiments across their business everywhere. Now, uh, on the eight weeks of this program, it was pretty amazing. We came up with some fantastic ideas. We created the first ever blockchain identity management uh, for, solution for the airline industry. We created different types of products for analytics of customer data that take minutes, that used to take months. Um, but we also had to unlearn how to do innovation in the company. Some of the ideas that came out of that uh, eight weeks, we put back into the existing uh, project and program management processes in the organization to try and get teams to own them and scale them. Uh, how do you think that went? Yeah, not so great. Yeah, basically we burnt a whole load of paper money, airplanes, but they were made out of money, right? Um, and it was it was a tough thing to learn that all the momentum and speed that you build up with a cross-functional team working an idea, when you hand that off to a different party that are already 100% capacity up to up to the maximum of their own work and trying to push your ideas onto them, not only do they have no capacity, they've no context, and that killed the idea. But Again, with a lot of unlearning and relearning is taking the information and feeding that forward to the next thing. So what we recognized is that we, although uh, uh, we had these amazing assets in the airline industry, we weren't making the best use of them. So why don't we flip the model? So uh, as a result, British Airways opened up all their customer data to startups to start. They, they created an op open API system. So startups can leverage all their existing assets and build new services on top of their services to innovate in ways that the company doesn't have capacity or context for. 
And we started the first ever venture capital firm in the airline industry called Hangar 51, where companies can go in and be part of a venture firm with the airline industry. The company, we, uh, AIG takes a portion of uh, capital with inside those companies and they get to build on top of their assets. They're into the fourth cohort now. They've done efforts in London um, and in Barcelona, and they're literally transforming the airline industry with the levels of innovation that they're creating. So, you know, all of these sorts of on learning processes and while these products and services are great, um, the lasting impact uh, throughout the whole organization has not been the products they've done. It's actually been the shift in mindset because all those executives have gone back into the organization and now they're coaches for other people in the organization as they start to unlearn. So they've had a systemic impact in the behaviors about how the organization runs, operates right from the leadership. Because once the leadership start to change their behavior, what happens? Everybody starts to mimic their behavior. Um, and it's tough, right? Because um, as the CDO for their um, uh, Avias, which is their, their program for uh, point systems said, you know, when 97% of people tell you that you should stop doing what you're doing, that's the time that you need to increase your experiment velocity to find the breakthrough, the push through and get the innovations that you're looking for. And that requires a lot of dedication, commitment and courage. Um, so the other thing I was asking people about, what did they want to know? Um, and one of my favorite things to unlearn, just like the executive had to unlearn, is move from uh, knowing it all to actually learning it all. Um, and this is one of the biggest challenges, especially with people for expertise because you're hired for your expertise. You become an executive because you're very competent at your job. All the behaviors that made you the CEO of the company are the behaviors that made you the CEO of the company, the most successful position in the company. So it's very, very hard for these people to recognize why they should adapt their behavior when all their metrics and their feedback mechanisms tell them that they're doing the right things to rise to the prominent position in the organization. Um, and I see this problem a lot all the time. I work with, um, let's just call them a really well-known phone manufacturer. And one of the things the leadership team was trying to do is generate a new strategy for how they would roll out their phones uh, throughout the globe. And these people are experts in business strategy. They've been working in the industry for 15, 20 years, and they had designed the most perfect business strategy and processes they believed to launch their new phones uh, in the market. Um, so for me, when I started working with them, I wanted to help them understand how they could test that strategy uh, and make it more resilient. So when you're working uh, with a group of people who have a hypothesis for business strategy, how, how can you help them test it? Well, you can get them to be a customer of their own strategy. So what I did is I gave five of them a $200 prepaid credit card. And I told them they had two hours, which was the settlement in the SLA of their agreement, to go out and sign up to their own service uh, within the two hours that they said. How do you think they got on? Out of five, how many do you think completed the task? Zero, nearly one. One person got it done. Um, right, but the amount that they learned from being a customer of the systems that they believed were operating in certain ways, the assumptions that they thought were true, but actually turned out to be false, was an amazing learning opportunity. But it was also really, really, really safe to fail, right? They didn't have the entire organization staring at them as they were rolling out their strategy. They weren't on, in front of um, a crowd like tonight telling people that the strategy is perfect. There were five people in a room with a $200 credit card trying to sign up to a service that they created. So it allowed them to safely break their mental models of the world, shift their mindset by behaving differently and see the power of these behaviors acting as a customer of your own systems. Has anyone ever seen the show Undercover Boss? Exactly the same types of methods that we talk about in customer and user research. It's just applying it to a different level. Does anybody know who this is? Come on, shout it out. Come on, you. John Laguerre. Why, why is John Laguerre an interesting character? He's eccentric. Yes, he is indeed. Absolutely. 
All right, so uh, John Laguerre is the C, uh, CEO of uh, T-Mobile. Um, and when he took over T-Mobile, they were struggling business. They uh, were one of the lower performing networks. They were up against uh, the titans of uh, Verizon, AT, AT&T, and um, Sprint. Uh, so when John, John's a background in business strategy, very astute um, uh, business leader. Uh, so when John was hired on his first day, uh, you know, he started a new company. What, what do you think he did to try and find out how the company was operating and, and, and how, uh, how it was working? What would a typical CEO do as soon as they get a new job? What, if, what, when you get a new CEO, what do you want to do? Change the furniture, very important, yes. <laughs> Have a meeting. Yeah, that's right, get meetings, right? Yeah, let's, let's get the PowerPoints out. Let's do it. Uh, everybody comes in and pitches their idea of what's going to save the company, typically what happens, right? These are the behaviors that we expect. So uh, what John did something very, very different. He didn't have any PowerPoint presentations. Actually, he didn't talk to anybody inside his organization. He got a phone line installed in his office from the customer service support line. And he sat there and listened to customer support uh, service calls for four hours a day uh, for the first four weeks of his job. Literally sat there every day listening to the complaints customers were having, trying to understand the problems customer had with their service, what they were doing, what they were not doing, how to get raw information from the source about the problems with their systems of work, the signals from their system about what was wrong with their system so he could improvement or improve it. And what he learned straight away was people didn't understand their phone contracts. They didn't understand how much they were paying for phones. If they traveled, would they turn on their data? They didn't know how much their data was. There was so much variability in their contracts. It was super opaque and really difficult for them. So John used the information from his customers to unlearn how the way contracts should work in the telephone and telecommunications industry. And as a result, John launched on Uncontract, the first ever uncontracted phone where you would pay $70 a month to flat cap your fees with limited data per plan. Does anyone remember when this happened? And it obliterated the market because everybody knew at T-Mobile, you just paid 70 bucks a month and you were guaranteed what your phone was, you were guaranteed what your data was. Um, and he's been through multiple iterations of their unlearned contract. They're up to unlearned and Evan now where they're making radical changes to the way telecommunications and service providers are used. They have things like free international calls, capped international calls when you travel, capped international data plans when you travel. And all of this is informed from the data that he's gathering from his customers to unlearn what's working, relearn what should to get the breakthroughs they need to obliterate their industry. Um, and everyone knows probably just recently, they just started to buy Sprint, which makes them now the third largest carrier and are now starting to challenge and totally reshift AT&T and Verizon, which is a massive shift for an organization in the space of time that they've done it in. So these are like some of the powers about understanding the power of unlearning and using your customers to help calibrate when you're not achieving the outcomes that you want and how you can start to adapt your behavior, change what you're doing. So the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was mistakes, because people asked a bit about failure and how to manage failure. Um, and mistakes are actually one of the most powerful things that can happen inside an organization. And actually, if you leverage mistakes well, they can become a competitive advantage for your organization. Because mistakes are signals from the system that the system is not operating as you expected. And if you can catch mistakes early, that means you can make a more resilient system. And when you're dealing with high complexity, high uncertainty, it's better to have a more resilient system than a system that doesn't fail. So my favorite example of this is uh, from NASA. Um, and NASA have had some very, very public failures, unfortunately, catastrophic failures that resulted in, in losses of life. Um, and with the Challenger sh shuttle in, in 1986, the engineers actually told Mission Command not to launch. They knew there was an issue or had a sense there was an issue with, with the, uh, the, the aircraft and they didn't want them to launch. They did, and it resulted in catastrophic lo uh, loss of life. Um, 
But many people inside NASA actually just saw that as an act of God. They had had a perfect history of launches, no, no losses of life, uh, amazing experiences and radical innovations in terms of space travel, putting people on the moon, a number of firsts uh, for, for humans. Um, but then again, when we had the Columbia disaster short, shortly after that, they actually had a term for um, when the, the tiles would break off the rocket and hit, and hit the wings. It was called foam shedding. Um, and it was a behavior that was known. It was a deviant actual behavior, uh, as it was later uh, described um, by Daniel Vaughan in, in, the, in the report. You know, and so what happens in a lot of organizations is we do let deviant behavior start to persist. Um, now, I, I work with Dr. Ed Hoffman. He was the first uh, uh, chief knowledge officer at NASA. He's a mentor of mine, and um, I do some work with him in his programs in Columbia University. And what he was explaining is that often NASA had to fail big before it would cause a shift in mindset uh, where people started to recognize the things that they were doing was, were not working correctly. Um, and this is really, really difficult for NASA because they had very, very, very smart people who are used to being correct and who are constantly correct in a lot of things that they do and build a behavior of being so correct. And one of the other problems they had is that they had so many, much information, uh, uh, they the information leaders that turned into knowledge silos and ultimately no information was being passed across their organization. That's what caused a lot of these problems. So it was Ed's job to try and break down those silos, to try and help people how to unlearn being smart and relearn how making mistakes was actually a good thing and sharing mistakes was even a more powerful thing. Now, there's a couple of things um, to understand about when you change, change the culture in organizations. You basically have two levers. Edgar Stein will talk about survival anxiety and learning anxiety. Now, survival anxiety is the idea that you'll often hear people say, if you don't do something, your business is going to be disrupted. Or if we don't act now, uh, we're, we're going to miss this opportunity. People are trying to peak your survival anxiety, keep you awake. Um, now, the problem with that is it works to a, a point and then people stop listening. Who here has been told that their business is going to die in the last year? And your business is still alive, most likely, right? So people sort of go, yeah, yeah, our business is going to die, but we're still here. We don't, we don't make changing. The only thing, uh, the endless tap of innovation, of encouraging people to try new behaviors and relearn, is you have to reduce learning anxiety. And learning the anxiety is the idea that how safe do people feel to try new behaviors? And if they don't get desired results, how will they be treated or perceived in the organization? How safe does it feel for them to learn new things, to try new things? So as a leader, the tap that you can use to create endless innovation is not constantly peak survival anxiety, but constantly reduce learning anxiety and getting people to try new things. So the way that me and Ed would then try and describe why mistakes are a good thing is we talk about a pyramid of advantage and catastrophe. The idea is uh, lots of mistakes uh, happen in complex systems. And the trick is if you can catch problems when they're mistake and socialize them with other people, you can improve the resiliency of the system. You can improve the knowledge of the system. Because if you uh, share mistakes, they avoid mishaps. And mishaps are where there's a catastrophic failure, but the mission is generally successful. Because the problem is if mistakes become mishaps and ultimately are, become uh, catastrophic failures, that's what can lead uh, terrible outcomes. So making this culture of sharing mistakes was really, really important in NASA, but really, really hard. Um, are people familiar with the Google's Aristotle project? Has anyone ever heard of this before? Yeah, so Google did a study to find out what created high performance teams. The number one indicator for high performance teams was not how smart you are. It's not if you knew how many M&Ms it takes to fill the Empire State Building. It was actually the ability uh, to ha have high psychological safety in the team. The teams could share uh, things that, uh, with one another, mistakes that they had made, things that they tried that didn't work and not perceive that it was a, a, their own situation. The other things were like dependability, uh, clear articulation of what they're trying to achieve, impact of their work and understanding how their work contributes to something bigger. So when we started to talk a lot about this, it enabled people at NASA to say, well, let's start really, really small. We can't change the whole culture of the company and get everybody suddenly talking about it. So what I used to do was get key leaders from cross-functional disciplines across the organization together and start to share their stories. 
little stories about things that they tried, things that worked, things that didn't work, new information that they discovered. A lot of the things that they're working on is totally emergent information. For an example is space junk. Space junk is a massive problem. There is no expert in the world on space junk. Actually, the people who have the most information about space junk are actually NASA. And what typically was happening was people were writing theses centrally in Washington about what space junk was about. Um, and then suddenly the practitioners started to realize, well, why would someone be writing a thesis about space junk? We're learning about it through actual experimentation and the work that we're doing. So we should start writing those policy documents. We should start sharing the mistakes, the information that we're learning. So the community started to write their own policies and procedures and disseminate them rather than a central authority start to do it. Essentially, they started to create their own Wikipedia um, for space science and information written by practitioners for practitioners and then making that common knowledge in the world. So these are sort of some of the powerful things to think about when you're trying to change a culture um, and starting really, really small and just getting people to share stories, mistakes that they were making. And that led them to avoid lots of mishaps. And thankfully, NAFTA hasn't had um, any catastrophic failures um, or resulting in loss, loss of lights uh, since the Columbia disaster. You know, and but so they've done really well to reduce learning anxiety and relearn those behaviors. But they don't want to fall into a trap of letting complacency set in. Um, so uh, every year on the 27th of January, uh, NASA shuts down the whole um, of the company. Uh, and they invite in the families of people from Columbia and Challenger to share stories of their families, the way that people they miss, uh, why they were so passionate about being part of the space program. Because um, they want to speak a little bit of uh, survival anxiety and help people realize uh, that complacency can set in. Today, uh, uh, 45, only 45% 45 of the people who work at NASA were involved are there when um, uh, the Columbia disaster happened. So half the company have never been through this. So by creating these spaces to honor uh, the work that people have done, but also to not let complacency set in, that way they keep reducing learning anxiety uh, and peaking survival anxiety to avoid complacency. So. Um, really, the question I want to pose to you tonight um, is, you know, how you can start to unlearn something about what, what you're going to do. And the trick I always say to people is you've got to think big about an aspiration or outcome that you want to try and achieve. But it's actually about starting really, really, really small, way smaller than you even think. And um, so the, the little method that I have for people to try and get through this is, Think about a problem that you're struggling with right now or an outcome that you're trying to achieve and you can't get there. Um, and then find somebody who you work with and you trust and ask them on a scale of one to 10, how well do they think you're performing the behavior you're trying to achieve the outcome that you want? Um, and you know, they'll give you a scale between one and 10, write that down. Um, and then ask them, you know, what is one thing you could do to just get half a point better? Right? If you could try some new little behavior just to get half a point better and get them to try and write down a few ideas with you. And then maybe pick the one that feels most uncomfortable or the one that will challenge you a little bit or take a little bit of courage to do and commit to it for a week. And then come back and sit down with that person who you originally wrote or sat down with and see what results you've achieved and start to iterate from there. Starting to experiment with these new behaviors will help you relearn. So, and you can get to these amazing uh, results and outstanding results by starting really, really small. Um, on the 27th of March this year, IAG launched an entire new airline. They sold 52,000 seat, seats on the first day. They sold 147,000 seats within the first month. They launched a new airline to disrupt the low-cost carrier transatlantic airline groups called Level. It's got four flights it's flying from Barcelona to the US. They've got there by these small experiments that we started with in exec camp, changing the culture, changing the leadership mindset, opening up for open innovation. And now they're starting to do massive things like shift entire airline industries to use these new behaviors. So the takeaways I want you to think about when you go back um, 
if you're going to start to unlearn, it's about thinking big, have a big aspiration or outcome that you want to achieve, but start small, like really, really small. You'll be surprised what you can do and start to build momentum and learn fast what works and what doesn't. Choose courage over comfort, right? Take steps that take you outside your comfort zone. That's where all the growth and impact is, not doing things that feel comfortable to you, but being comfortable with getting uncomfortable. And the way to get there is to scale safety in your organization, make it safe to experiment so people can try new behaviors, reduce learning anxiety, start small, find out what works and iterate from there. And um, if you're curious to find out about more about Unlearn, all you got to do is start really, really small. Just got to open the book and start reading. But my small step uh, for me would be that could have an exponential impact is if you read the book and enjoy it, just leave a really, really small review on Amazon and other people will have an impact that you might have from it. Uh, my name has been Barry O'Reilly. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks Barry for a great talk. We're gonna um, do Q&A now. The way this works is we have to, you have to use the microphone so we can capture on the video. So if you don't have a mic, please don't ask a question. Just raise your hand and we have some people that are run mics. And, uh, oh, right here, here you go. Thank you, Barry. There was a very nice talk. Um, you know, when you talk about like unlearning at the executive level, most of the executives have got there with behaviors and, uh, you know, they're mostly top down in, in their way of working. Yeah. So when somebody who's trying to do a transformation like yourself and you're operating at not a level where you can reach to the executives on a regular cadence, yeah. how do you use your influence in, in that case to change behaviors? Yeah, I think um, a, a lot of this comes down to uh, trying to give them experiences that help them learn something new very quickly and safely, right? Like what, what executives are interested in is making good decisions. Um, and unfortunately, executives get really, really bad information, right? So if you think about how executives get information in organizations, Somebody writes a report on your transformation and probably says transformation is red. And they pass it to their manager who are like, red, I might get shouted at, change that to an amber, amber is going to be cool. Then it goes to the next level and then they're like, Jesus, amber, better rub that out, make sure it's a green. Yeah, right. So executives are looking at these dashboards of bad information and therefore they're making bad decisions or good, like they're making a good decision with bad information. Right, so they get poor results. Um, so a lot of the tactics that you probably see me using there are trying to short circuit that. It's trying to give them raw information, right? That challenges their existing mental model of the world, but in a safe way helps them learn new things. What they believe to be true is not true. So I'm constantly trying to create experiences to help them see the, what's really happening rather than what they're being told. And you know, we get to experience that uh, very regularly in a team when you sit down with a customer and do your user testing once a week or you know you do an interview with somebody who you're designing a process for and they tell you you know the new process sucks because we, they don't even work in that way and executives don't get a lot of that liberty you know and and a lot of these ideas are not new right it's like hp had management by walking around toyota have the uh, get to gamma go and seize you know we talk a lot about get out of the building or get out of the office um so, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to create those sort of little experiences for them that they can quickly see what they believe to be true might not be true, and they get better data and make better decisions. So that's sort of a little design challenge, I would say, for you is how can you design those type of experiences and experiments for your leadership team so they might think the program's going great? How can you safely show them that it's not going great? I don't get a hundred people to stand around and make them press a red button so they look like foolish. Make it safe for them to fail or safe for them to learn. Um, so that's the kind of tactic that would get you to think about, right? The, the $200 credit card was just a safe way for them to test their own strategy and see the gaps in it and improve it. And they all valued that. So that's the way I try to tackle those issues. Cool. Good question. So, uh, our organization, you know, we are 
kind of uh, tolerate all the failure and it's okay to fail. And we have a weekly meeting where we discuss test results, but product management still tends to discuss only successes. And people kind of slowly run into that mode that people only discuss success. Yeah. How you can change that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that that's normally a signal for me that it's not safe to talk about failure. To, honestly, that that's why. Um, and, you know, the, the way I think about it is you have people who talk about epic failures that they would never do again. They have the sort of, you know, meaty ground, which is like, hey, we failed, but we learned this cool thing and this is how we're adapting. And then you get into the mode where I'm just going to tell you happy stories all the time, you know, and I think it's very people can learn a lot from uh, stories of success, right? Like the reason we all come to these talks is you want to hear me share stories of things that I tried, things that worked, things that I would do differently. You know, like I, I think they're the kind of questions I start probing. So when people just keep telling you a success, 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 I would ask them, well, what's one thing you're going to do differently? based on even the successful outcome that you had, because you'll get more of a sort of learning story there. And um, what would you do differently if you were to do this project again? What were the things that you thought were true at the start, but are different now that you've done it? Right, there's subtle ways to try and tease out the real lessons rather than just listen to people go, yeah, you know, the customers weren't converting. And then we wrote one line of code and now we were converting at 50%. Great story. What did, how did you find that out? What would you do differently if you were to do it again? You, you need to sort of pull threads. Um, so that's another safer way for people who are afraid to talk about failure, but find ways to get them to tell the lessons they've learned or the things they would do differently. That's the sort of hack I tend to do in those scenarios. Um, so maybe that's a tactic for you. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, Lee. I've got the hecklers up the front tonight, so good. How you doing, man? Hey, buddy. Hey, quick question. Like, how have you seen environments where they, they structured like this trust of failure? Like, this is like for organizations to grow. Yeah. Like, you can't just say top down they're going to do this. They have to build an environment. Yeah. Where everyone understands that, that these are the principles where you could fail, you could learn. Yeah. Have, how have you seen other companies? Yeah, that's a great that? question. Um, so my the, the company I'm currently working at the moment, they're they're a video streaming company, and um, they're having they were having real difficulties. Trust had eroded between their product and engineering organizations to the point that people would just escalate. Right. Anytime there was a, a, a an a issue between a designer and engineer, they'd escalate it to the engineering manager, who'd escalate it to the CTO. And literally, I was in meetings with the CTO and this chief product officer. It's like a 1980s film, like standing off in front of each other and like everyone's behind each gang. And they're like, no, yeah, no, Jira ticket one through seven, eight. It was meant to have this in it, you know, and like, um, the, the, you know, the, 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 what a CTO and, and CPO are doing in that meeting, leading those meetings is, is beyond me, you know. Um, and but the great thing is they recognize that behavior, right? They recognize that this wasn't good behavior and the behavior they wanted. So um, we set some sort of constraints to try and start building up this trust. So the first thing is the executive team said that they weren't gonna partake in any more meetings, right? They were gonna get their directs, VP levels and above. That's the highest level of escalation that they could work from. And they didn't want any escalation from that group. So it was, uh, a couple of engineering managers, a couple of the product groups have now got together. And, and one of the first exercises we did was we did a, a what we call like a, a a culture creator where we wrote like what's the at the very top we wrote what's the mission of this group right is to create a great environment where people feel fun at work and are, are we're in the entertainment business we want to have a fun place to work um, and then we did a level of like well what what values will tell us that we're being like that and very quickly people who were who were arguing before started posting values that matter to them like trust like autonomy uh, so they started to realize that they actually had more in common with each other at a values level which is really really powerful right and um, and then we just started to say well what behaviors would hold us accountable to these values and the teams posted a whole load of behaviors so we sort of created this like social contract working agreement to say this is what good culture looks like that reflects the values that we care about, that the mission that we're trying to achieve. Um, and they played that back to their executive team and they started to present it out. 
to the teams that they lead. So now they've got this accountability framework to sort of say, if you're not demonstrating these behaviors, you're counter, you know, you're countering the culture we're trying to create and people can be accountable to that. So, and some of the behaviors are like, be willing to give direct feedback to help somebody improve rather than just going, you know, you suck. I'm going to tell your manager. So again, it's, it's, but these are all very small things that we've started to work on and get there. Um, and again, the, the, the thing big is to radically change the whole way the company operates and works together. And the start small was just calling out the behaviors that mattered, holding people accountable to them. Um, and they actually realized they had way more alignment than they thought they did by just doing that exercise to start. So there, there's a, we had a meeting today and I was telling them we, I was doing this book launch and we were, they were joking, like, can they be in the next book if, if we figure this out? So hopefully they might be, that's, that's a good, good story. Cool. Yep. Yeah, Marco. Yeah. So what would you recommend to someone who is not a CEO? Because it seems like, you know, the change has to start from the top and then go yeah. down. But let's say you're a team leader and you want to have change, but maybe, you know, the company you're working in, it's kind of against the change or is a way yeah. stuck with the status. So yeah. how can that be solved? Uh, I'm going to show you one of my favorite slides that I show people about when you're trying to transform companies. Um, you know, and the, the thing is, like, you're all leaders, right? It's just, it's very easy to just point to the CEO and say, you're the leader of the whole organization um, and put it all on their desk. And, and I, I, I think that's not fair, right? Because it's a system, right? And some are hierarchical, but most of them are actually sort of mixed up, right? People who can be very low in the hierarchy, but can have a huge amount of influence. And so I always say when you're creating transformation, it's about creating the space for transformation to happen. So if you're an, a CEO, sure, people are going to replicate your behaviors and the space you create the whole, through the whole company. But you can be a leader of your team and create space for them to let innovation and transformation happen by protecting them. So what I do is um, I, I hand out these things to people when I start working with them. Uh, it's called like the shit umbrella, you know, and, and your job is to create an umbrella to cover people from, from this shit. If anybody um, wants to buy one of these umbrellas, see, see this Amazon link? It's an affiliate link, so the money goes to me. But what I do is I put all the money into a shit umbrella fund. And I buy these umbrellas for leaders when I work with them in organizations and I hand them out when I start working. So your shit umbrella purchases will go back to a virtuous cause of creating more shit umbrellas to help transform organizations. I've got about 10 people that can do that. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, right. There you go. Cool. Yeah, that's okay. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, look. Um, Please, uh, you know, think big. I know it's a big book. Start small with the first chapter and then um, enjoy the book. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it helpful. If you do tell more people about it, you'd be amazed the impact you can have by just sharing a couple of tweets and stuff about it. So again, thanks for Dan for having me. I have a great meetup and I look forward to hearing your feedback on the book. All right. Take care. Great. Right, thanks a lot, Barry. Appreciate it.